Okay, so the intention of this talk is is to provide you some background and 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 uh, theory behind time series insert techniques. This is not meant to be a, a deep dive at all. Uh, oh, I have it in auto run. Can you see my slides? Is that good enough? I don't want it to auto play. Yes, it looks good. Yeah. So. We will not be able to answer all the questions on time series, but this is just to provide you an overview of what is happening in the community and what the latest developments are or what the history of development of time series techniques has been. And this is not really just my talk. This is material put together from all different people the, around the world and, and research results. So the overview of this talk is we're going to talk a little bit about motivation for time series interferometry. Then we're going to talk about the different time series INSAR methods uh, that are being developed um, and talk about how they're different from each other. And if time permits, we'll talk about implementation of these processing chains, but I've added these slides in the backup. I, I suspect we won't be able to get to uh, them in time. So let's talk about a single interferogram. We've been processing a single interferogram with TopSAP and StripMap app. And, and from the uh, theory lessons and, and from lectures yesterday, uh, we've, we've kind of understood that a single interferogram measurement of uh, consists, the phase you measure consists of multiple components. There's the deformation component, which is what we're trying to uh, be interested in, trying to estimate. But this is affected by troposphere noise, ionosphere noise, there could be errors in your DEM, there could be error in knowledge of your orbits, and then there's scattering noise. And we, on top of that, we measure all of this only modular 2 pi, um, and then we have to unwrap. So for, for the NISAR mission, JPL built a, a model that tries to estimate how much uh, uh, error we expect in interferograms globally. Uh, and here's a simple table. This shows you the relative contributions of the different components um, for an interferogram where we are trying to measure deformation between two points that are 50 kilometers apart. As you can see, the, the primary source of error is troposphere, at least in these latitudes. It could be different as we go further, as we get closer to the polar regions where ionosphere could also play a much significant role. And ionosphere, activity also changes as time in the solar cycle. So that is also a factor to take into account. But uh, uh, roughly, we have about four centimeter of error between two points that are 50 kilometers apart just from a single interferogram. Uh, Barstow is, is a fairly optimistic area, very arid, uh, almost no vegetation. And even in that case, you see about two centimeters of deformation. Uh, another thing we discussed in the theory was a decorrelation. Here's a, a plot of, uh, I'm plotting spatial coverage, that is the number of pixels with co uh, coherence greater than 0.4 or correlation greater than 0.4 over scenes in LA, which is a fairly urban area, fairly well correlated. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that the spatial coverage decreases as the temporal baseline increases. So does the, uh, uh, with increasing a perpendicular baseline. For Sentinel-1 base and ISAR, baseline is less of a factor. We're more, uh, um, we, we maintain a tight orbit tube, uh, so temporal separation of the interferogram is, is what matters. So individual interferograms are impacted by decorrelation, depending on how far apart the two images are in time and how far apart the, the imaging baseline is. So one um, limitation that comes out naturally from this is if you are trying to monitor slowly deforming areas, you need to wait long enough for the deformation signal to build up. But as you wait long enough, you're going to get poor spatial coverage. So one way of mitigating this could probably be combining multiple short uh, temporal baseline interferograms where you have better spatial coverage in each of them and you try to combine information in them to improve your spatial coverage while monitoring a slowly deforming uh, region. 
uh, another issue is in the, if you're doing a single interferon gram measurement with a long temporal baseline, you have a, a fair bit of atmosphere um, and the correlation component to it. However, if you were to combine multiple interferograms, you might be able to better constrain the, the uh, uncertainties on your estimated, uh, say, uh, interseismic velocity or slowly deforming uh, velocity estimates. And uh, moreover, these interferograms are likely to be more coherent and you're likely to make fewer unwrapping errors in, in, in the shorter temporal baseline um, uh, interferograms. Um, the third uh, limitation. Can I ask a quick question to the last slide? Yes. Um, you say that atmospheric contributions are uncorrelated in time. Um, so this, yes, go ahead. How, maybe I'm understanding that wrong, but it seems like you could definitely have like really similar atmospheric like uh, disturbances over like mountains and stuff? Uh, so the that atmosphere- That like really similar through time, I mean. Yeah, the, the, the main issue with INSAR is not uh, uh, the, I think the uh, trends introduced by topography. So you can think of the atmospheric component as consisting of two components. One is due to the stratification, which is what the atmospheric models try to uh, correct for. And then there's the natural turbulence component which you cannot correct for. And the turbulence component is, is uncorrelated in time. Okay, gotcha. Thanks for that clarification. Yep. The, the third limitation of working with single individual interferograms, I, I remember an example from one of the students mm -hmm. for, yep. Can I just shortly follow up? So this is a good point though. The, um, you know, when you think of, I'm not sure if you go through that exercise, but one thing that you always try to do in in these stacks is you sort of count on the signal, the atmospheric signal, to be temporarily uncorrelated so that you can filter it out. What that means is that uh, before you do stack processing, it does make sense in places where there's you know significant topography to first try to do something like uh, geckos or 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 train to to take out the topography related phase. That can be substantial, but it can be well corrected usually using um, atmospheric models. Um, so that's the um, assumption of temporal uncorrelated signals uh, holds true to some extent. Wow, that's very helpful. Thank you, Franz. The, uh... I remember a student showing an example of Ridgecrest where there were like blatant phase unwrapping errors. And this is always a problem when you're working with individual interferograms. However, if you have multiple interferograms, for example, if you have three scenes, you form all three interferograms, and you operate under the assumption that most of the data uh, is, is unwrapped well, you're able to identify phase unwrapping anomalies by checking for consistency and are able to correct them. Here's plots from uh, Yunjin, and Harish has worked with him a lot too, on um, our ability to estimate phase unwrapping errors, uh, which is as a function of fraction of, uh, um, here's the input percentage on these plots represent fraction of image that has unwrapping errors in it. And on uh, output, uh, how much of it has been, uh, he was able to correct. So you want to talk more about this, Harish, if he's online? Uh, no, I think you explained. Yeah, so you can find more details of this, and you'll also probably uh, talk more about this when you get to the MintPy exercise. So doing these redundancy checks are really useful for phase unwrapping detection. The other limitation which is not quite relevant for for sentinel one and nisar but very relevant for other missions that you will work with uh, because of uh, significantly changing imaging baselines are dem errors if your dems are not very um, uh, precise you may introduce a systematic phase component that's correlated with your baseline 
So uh, once you start using multiple interferograms, you may be able to estimate out the systematic uh, uh, phase component. Uh, here's a plot for uh, perpendicular baseline versus time for ALOS from Horatius paper. In this case, you can see if you were using data only from this period, 2009 to 2011, the baseline is consistently increasing. So it's easy to uh, misinterpret uh, DEM error as deformation because they're correlated. So uh, there are other, uh, those were the limitations of using a single interprogram. Um, there may be other motivations for time series NSAR. One is, of course, the science argument. Would time history tell us more about the, the geophysical phenomena in our region? Would it let us decouple contributions from different phenomena? Because these phenomena may operate on different time scales. One may be on a, on a seasonal scale. One could be lasting several years and so on. And, and of course, the other major driver is overcoming the limitations of the INSAR and increasing the reliability of your uh, estimates. In general, time series techniques can be broken down into three different uh, families of techniques. The, the very first family of techniques that we saw in literature were the persistent scatter methods. This is uh, really popular with the engineering group. Uh, analysis is done at high resolution uh, at the single full resolution pixel scale. These techniques tend to be computationally intensive. And these are typically used for small area analysis and, and infrastructure monitoring. Uh, that's where these, the origin of these techniques are. Nowadays, these uh, with improvements in computational capabilities, we're now able to deploy this over wider areas as well. Uh, the second series of techniques are the shard baseline techniques, which is probably what most people in this class uh, and, and most people in the, in the tectonics community use. These are really, uh, more popular with scientists than with engineers. Uh, the analysis is done at a lower resolution, a multi looked pixel scale, a lot of spatial averaging, filtering of interferograms. This is typically used for large area analysis uh, for tectonic applications. Uh, the, new, the third set of methods are, are covariance based methods. These are really uh, essentially combining the best of these two worlds. Uh, these are relatively new and still under development, uh, but very promising. These are essentially extensions of PS techniques. They are a newer approach and becoming more popular. And there is evidence building up that these are more robust and less biased, uh, but of course this is an active area of research. So what I'll do next is talk about briefly about these three uh, families of techniques. So starting with PS and DS, what is what is what are PS and DS? PS stands for persistent scatterers, and DS stands for distributed scatterers. So um, if you remember the theory slides from Paul, uh, a single pixel on the ground can consist of multiple scatterers. If the reflectivity of the different scatterers in a pixel are, are comparable with each other, that pixel uh, is called a distributed scatterer because there's no single source that you can pinpoint within that uh, um, pixel from where the energy is being reflected. If you had a single point scatterer, uh, which almost never happens in real life, um, you would be able to pinpoint just from the received signal where the energy is located within the pixel or is being reflected from within the pixel. What we do encounter in real life is often the case where there's a dominant scatterer. So if you have a corner reflector, if you have buildings where the walls and the roofs align and form corner reflector-like structures that, that reflect back signals strongly, they dominate the return signal compared to other scatterers in the background. If you were to plot the, the, the uh, return phase characteristics, uh, for an ideal single point scatterer, you must pretty much see a constant phase. Uh, for a dominant scatterer, you might see a little bit of spread. And for a distributed scatterer, there's a lot of spread uh, in the phase measured from the same pixel over time. So what PS techniques try to do is identify dominant scatterers in your imagery. For example, if you had N images like this, 
it uses statistical techniques to identify pixels that are that are stable over time. So here I've marked four pixels whose amplitudes seem relatively stable over time, though the surrounding uh, pixels may change. So these are statistically driven techniques identifying pixels whose characteristics remain stable over time. And those, we, we label them as persistent scatterers or permanent scatterers. So for a PS interferogram network, uh, since the pixel is stable in time, analysis is sufficient to form a single reference network. Um, uh, since the spread in phase is so small, forming redundant uh, interferograms pretty much only helps you in the phase and wrapping process. But for the rest of the analysis, you can do pretty much most of the analysis using a single reference um, image, which is typically located in the middle of your time series. You co-register all your other images to that image, and then you do your statistical analysis um, over those. That's that's how PS techniques initially worked. The simplest PS identifying and identification technique is to look at amplitudes. Uh, once you've co-registered all your images, uh, you look at the standard deviation of the amplitude of a given pixel and its ratio to its mean. This is called amplitude dispersion. This is the first paper from Ferretti et al. The, the idea being, if your amplitude dispersion is small, your phase tends to be stable. This works really well in urban areas. Uh, of course, uh, this model assumes a signal, uh, a signal model where there's a constant plus a Gaussian noise modeling the, the return from a, um, pixel with a dominant scatterer, assuming this constant represents the, the scattering from the dominant scatterer and the Gaussian part represents the scattering from the surrounding pixels. Of course, there have been extensions. Uh, you can fine tune it to say there are two dominant scatterers and so on, but essentially the idea remains the same. You're doing some sort of statistical analysis of amplitudes over time and determining which pixels are reliable enough and use only the phase from those pixels for your time series analysis. There's the other uh, set of PS techniques rely on phase stability uh, because the idea is you're interested in the phase. So uh, if you don't really uh, worry about amplitude variations, you identify a series of pixels which form a consistent phase network. Those should be good enough to, to estimate the deformation pattern in space and time. So the STAMPS uh, was a PS framework developed by Andy Hooper that emphasized phase stability more than amplitude stability, phase consistency more than amplitude stability. And the idea behind his approach was you can break down any interferogram into like, like we said, atmosphere components, uh, deformation atmosphere, orbit errors and topos, um, topography DEM errors and noise. And each of these have different spatiotemporal characteristics. The deformation he assumed, he was looking mostly at slowly deforming areas. The deformation is slowly varying in space and slowly varying in time, whereas atmosphere is slowly varying in space and quickly varying in time. Orbit errors, again, the assumption was the orbit errors are uncorrelated in time. And topospheric uh, error, like you said, is proportional to baseline, so you might be able to systematically estimate it. And uncorrelated noise terms are high frequency bottoms in, in space and time. So you're able to do filtering uh, in, in space and time and look for uh, phase consistency between pixel networks to determine PS. So it's an iterative approach, at least in the initial France um, stamps framework, and typically converges in seven to eight iterations. And his observation was this kind of approach work better in natural terrain than amplitude-based methods. Um, any questions? One question is, what, uh, which image do you want to keep as the reference image of the stack? Oh, so the typically, uh, this choice of picking the reference image as being centered in time and centered in baseline space. Um, I think this was largely driven by uh, the 
processing ability uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, this was uh, also when ERS and NVC pretty much ended their mission. So you could pick something right in the middle such that any process, assuming you make a processing error, you've minimized the processing error by, by picking something that's in middle of the base, um, geometric baseline space and uh, uh, temporal baseline space. I think uh, for most of our work, at least for Sentinel-1, geometric baseline really is not an issue. And we are still an active mission. Data will keep uh, continuing to be acquired. So in all our current approaches, we tend to pick a reference scheme that's early in time, and we just keep bringing all other imagery with respect to that imagery. I think this is, um, you, when these papers were written, you should remember that a lot of the work co-registration co was being done with polynomial-based co-registration. So your co-registration quality as the baseline increased tend to degrade the topography. Those are, those are still, of course, limitations, but I think they're less of a limitation nowadays. So yeah, maybe, oh, sorry. There's maybe one more point to this, if you can go back to the slide. One reason why um, initially it was sort of more proposed to to have a reference point, the reference acquisition in the middle, is um, if you if you limit PS processing to true point scatterers, then it doesn't matter where you put your your reference image if it's in the beginning or the middle or the end, uh, because for a true um, point scatterers, there is no temporal decorrelation, and therefore it doesn't matter how long the temporal baselines are. There's uh, some thought that if you, um, you, know, you apply some sort of selection criteria to, to pick uh, what you call persistent scatterers, and there's some uh, belief that if you put it in the middle in the baselines, the temporal baselines are still limited overall, um, you may find more PS points because you don't have to stick to pure point scatterers anymore. So it may be a little bit of a benefit in terms of point density to uh, pick something that's more in the middle of the time series, even though typically we don't do that anymore. So the idea, like I said, was to find these pixel networks. And so you have these sparsely spatially distributed points on which you then have to unwrap uh, uh, in space and time, and, and there are both kinds of approaches in, in literature. There are space-first approaches where you unwrap the interferograms in conventional 2D techniques and then try to adjust them in time for consistency, or you can do time-first, which tends to scale better for larger data volumes. So in which case, what you do is if you have three sparse points, you unwrap edge AB in time-first, AC in time first, BC in time first, and then do very few spatial adjustments. So most of the national map products that you see uh, uh, from say TRE and other people, all of them are able to scale to wider regions by uh, adopting a time first approach in phase unwrapping. Um, the PS techniques were, were great. There were a lot of uh, really cool results that came out. Uh, for example, the, the faults in the Bay Area study by TRE, then Andy applied it to uh, uh, Alcido and Galapagos with the ERS and NVSAT data. Um, one thing to note was uh, with ERS and NVSAT, they were, they were medium resolution sensors. And as higher resolution sensors became available, the PS techniques work uh, much better with higher resolution sensors. So the idea, the theory at least, and the idea is once you have a higher resolution image, there are fewer mixed pixels uh, in your image. So you're able to identify pixels with uh, more pixels with consistent um, statistical properties in time. And here's an example of, uh, the bottom is Terrasar X imagery, and on top is RadarSat 1, which whose resolution is like comparable to ERS uh, and NVSAT. So as Terrasar X and Cosmos Comet started becoming more popular, there were a lot of um, PS-based results. And these are, again, as you can see, these 
typically target small spatial regions for monitoring infrastructure say, and, and for localized phenomenon like landslides, et cetera. One thing to note is PS analysis is, is always performed at highest resolution and pixel selection techniques really rely on precise co-registration. I would like to emphasize that till like uh, three, four years ago, most freely available software, uh, say Roypack, Doris, uh, gmt -SAR, all of them, till Sentinel-1 came into the picture, everyone pretty much used a polynomial model for co-registering images. And those models quickly break down when the baseline is large or the range bandwidth is very high and topography is steep. So uh, consequently, engineering groups built more of these uh, geometry-based co-registration stuff, which is why PS techniques became more popular on the industry side than the science side. From, from a science perspective, uh, and like you uh, demonstrated today in your uh, homework exercises and in the notebooks yesterday, uh, pretty much uh, if you're doing any sort of tectonic studies or fault modeling, the first kind of thing we do is apply a quad tree. So whereas you're doing PS analysis at full resolution and you're generating 10, order of 10 to the power six and 10 to the power seven pixels of observations, whereas your modeling codes can only handle 100 to 1,000 points. So the, the, the question becomes you've done, you've expended so much energy and computing resources on generating a high res deformation map when you're going to downsample it and model it and probably use the modeling for your interpretation. So it became, uh, it wasn't as uh, an attractive proposition for the tectonics community. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, for, for sort of tectonics applications, resolution of a few hundred meters was typically more than sufficient. So uh, PS techniques were mostly uh, confined to the uh, engineering uh, and civil engineering applications. The, the second uh, type of methodology uh, that was developed was called small baseline uh, method. This was developed by the group in Napoli, Italy. And in this case, if you were to plot your images uh, in, as, uh, in the 2D space of time of acquisition and perpendicular baseline, in this case, we pick one image again in the middle uh, as reference, we combine all viable small baseline interferograms uh, to build up a deformation time history instead of just doing a common um, uh, reference network like we did for PS. The idea is we can, if you have n time epochs and n SAR scenes, we estimate the differential displacement between one epoch and the other as a, as a piecewise uh, linear function. And you're able to then say, oh, interferogram between scene T1 and T3 is actually the sum of deformation between T1, T2, and T2 plus T3. And you build this simple least square sort of network and, and are able to apply least squares on your uh, interferometric unwrapped phases and, and uh, recover the deformation time history. There are numerous variants of SPAS. The original SPAS implementation, like I said, was from the group in Napoli. They required uh, as much rigor and co-registration as PS methods, but then it was quickly, it was easy since it was just a simple least squares to realize that, oh, uh, you know, we, we can live with resolutions of 200, 250 meters. We heavily filter our interferograms and then we can relax the requirements on co-registration. As a result, people could take what workflows they had for generating uh, individual pairs of interferograms, geocode them, and just be able to run SPAS on the geocoded interferograms really quickly. So SPAS became really popular because the the barrier to entry was simpler. It was easier to it was lower. It was easier to implement. And if you look at the science community, most of the modifications to the SPAS does not address the earlier engineering aspects of generating good quality stacks, they only address the inversion of the data for the time series. Uh, they use stuff like wavelet coefficients at the inversion stage. They use GPS-like models for seasonal step functions, polynomials, et cetera. So there are numerous variants of SBAS, 
I'm sure uh, if you do a Google Scholar search, you'll find every alphabet hyphen S bas in, in, in some papers, either like T S bas, P S bas, N S bas, etc. Um, uh, S bas works great. Uh, here's an example from the, the Napoli Bay. I think this was from the original uh, S bas paper from Berardino et al. Um, the, the new techniques uh, that have uh, started emerging in the in, in, in time series uh, world over the last two, three years are called covariance-based techniques. And what these are trying to do is combine the best of both worlds. They, the, what they're trying, essentially trying to do is um, preserve the information at PS at full resolution while spatially averaging as needed to extract signal from the distributed scatterers based on similar neighbors. So the idea is the, resol the spatial resolution of the time series product depends on the pixel you're looking at because each pixel has a certain amount of spatial averaging that's gone into it. There's no uniform spatial resolution anymore, which is the case with PS, in which case it was full resolution. And, uh, and case with SBAS, where you used a simple multi-looking boxcar window to it. Um, this, has, this was first uh, proposed in 2008. Uh, uh, and you would have heard different uh, words in literature referring to these techniques. Squeezar essentially is, is a covariance-based technique. Caesar from the group in Napoli is also the same technique. Then there was a top eigenvalue approach from the uh, from Jean Glu's group in, in Texas. Then uh, off late you would have heard sequential estimator approach uh, building on top of these techniques uh, in literature recently. Um, so there are two essential aspects to this, smart spatial averaging, and then combination of all interferograms. Um, by design, these are extensions of PS techniques. So you can't take a, a, an SPAS chain uh, that you built from an individual pairwise processing chain and convert it to a covariance-based approach. You have to, uh, it needs the precise co-registration from a PS chain to be able to do this. It is computationally intensive. You get better results at cost of extra computation. So when I mean, Smart spatial, uh, when I say smart spatial averaging, um, what do I uh, mean by that? So in SPAS, if, 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 if my green pixel was the pixel of interest, I would average everything in this highlighted box as my averaging window to reduce it. In, in covariance space techniques, I, I Maybe I should, uh, one second, stop sharing. You are muted, Pius. Yeah, I can't hear you anymore. Ah, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I had to quickly turn off notifications that were popping up. Okay, so the idea is within this spatially averaging window that we would use for SPAS, we now only identify pixels that have the same uh, statistical properties as the, pixel, as the center pixel. So we are not going to blindly average all pixels in this window we go in and identify which pixels are statistically similar to mine and only use those for spatial averaging. Um, and this, this determination of, of which two pixels are, are statistically similar is done using histograms of amplitudes. You could pick any statistical measure. Uh, there are two, three papers on, on which methods work uh, well. Um, the, the idea behind this is uh, if you, Spatially averaging over sim statistically similar pixels makes your multi-looked estimate robust. 
Um, there's some papers going back to 2012 and also off late in 2022 where there are simple statistical models that show that combining information from inhomogeneous pixels could introduce phase bias in your um, multi-look uh, phases. So here's an example uh, of what this would look like uh, from a stack of SLCs over San Francisco. So we took 200 Cosmos Chimed SLCs, and if you look at uh, what we are plotting is the number of self-similar pixels for each pixel. Um, as you can see, this is the Golden Gate Park. So this is natural terrain, and these are buildings, uh, city blocks. Urban structures typically tend to have very few self-similar pixels because they tend to be PS-like, and you see the count of self-similar pixels is low. And over natural terrain or grassy areas, the count of self-similar pixels is high. So when you're doing multi-looking, these pixels would use more number of spatial looks than here. So in some sense, it's sort of feature preserving. And we can uh, demonstrate this by just looking at amplitudes. Uh, here's the original SLC uh, over, over uh, Golden Gate Park. You can see the salt and pepper-like speckle that, that Paul talked about in his lectures. And if you use this self-similar neighborhood to do spatial averaging, it's just the same image. You just multi-looked it using its self-similar neighbors. You'll see a lot more features get highlighted and features are preserved. So this is essentially what is happening when you smartly multi-look the interferogram. You're averaging pixels that are statistically similar to, to reduce noise on them, and you're not mixing in uh, homo inhomogeneous pixels. The second aspect of the covariance-based uh, methods is you want to extract information from all possible pairs. Uh, note that in the PS method, we used interferograms with respect to a single reference. In SPAS, we used interferograms which satisfied certain criterion that the temporal baseline and the, and the spatial baseline is small. But what this method is saying is I, I don't know which of the interferograms have information. I am going to use all possible pairs. Um, the, the other advantage is when you're trying to do automate something like SPAS, you have to make some sort of assumption about decorrelation models. And if you're working in areas like Alaska or Norway, or, or northern latitudes where the cor uh, correlation drops in winter and recovers in summer, then you have to start playing this trade-off game of, oh, I need to make one-year interferograms from the summer. All those sort of assumptions go away in the, in, in the covariance methods because you are essentially making all possible pairs. So if there is information to be extracted from any pair, you are using it for your analysis. Um, so, I'm also, there's, there's a slight uh, difference in nomenclature the, between covariance and correlation matrix. The covariance matrix is essentially our multi-looked interferogram. There is no normalization. This is, um, for a given pixel P, this is a, a covariance uh, matrix entry is just the multi-looked interferogram around that pixel. But as a correlation matrix, as you normalize the covariance matrix so that the magnitude remains between zero and one, the absolute value of the, of the correlation matrix uh, is between zero and one. So here's what a correlation matrix, as you can see, the magnitude of the correlation matrix is, is between zero and one would look like for uh, uh, one data set from, from Kurdistan, from, from Harish. So in an urban area, if you were, the X and the Y axis are the seen indices, and you can see that their off diagonal terms have high correlation. So the signal hardly decorrelates in this urban area. Um, whereas in an agricultural field, you get these periods where the, uh, the, the field is not plowed or, or harvesting has been done and it's dry where it stays coherent, but there are periods where there's no correlation at all. So what, what the covariance based, uh, techniques try to do is to use all possible information with all possible pairs to try and extract as much out of the data as possible. 
there's other evidence also building up for for uh, the requirement to for the benefit of using all possible pairs here's a paper from yuji zhang uh, you can probably look up her thesis from from stanford where she took a study a slow slip event and she did the analysis using unique pairings which is say you have four scenes a b and c d only use pairs such that there's no uh over scenes being used uh in common between the pairs for stacking and then she used redundant interferograms to, to separate out the signal and and she noticed uh that you know using redundant pairs and exploiting the correlation information between the interferograms will help you uh, beat down noise and, and look at more subtler deformation signatures. So once we build this, this covariance and correlation matrix on a pixel by pixel basis, how do we extract information of, from this? Um, a lot of this work the, that we use and now uh, was first developed in polarimetric multi-baseline approaches. Uh, where they're trying to do tomography, and but whatever they did was directly relevant for our NSAR stacking. So once you have the correlation or covariance matrix, you could just do a simple eigenvalue decomposition, a PCA of it, to, to get the most dominant phase pattern of it. However, Guarneri and Tabaldini showed that there's a more accurate inversion, which produces more robust results, and that method is now the basis of all covariance-based approaches. Uh, the really cool thing about the covariance correlation approach is the time series inversion happens in wrapped phase. So there's no chance of, of uh, phase unwrapping occurs later, but the consistency checks, uh, the consistency in, in time series inversion, all of that is taken care of in wrapped space because your correlation matrices are complex. The covariance matrices are complex. So you input a co-registered SLC stack and out comes an inverted SLC stack. The phases are still wrapped. And what we have noticed empirically playing with these techniques is what comes out is a cleaner SLC stack, which is often a lot easier to unwrap. Once you have the cleaner SLC stack, you can then just plug it back into whatever workflow you've already developed, cross-multiply, multi-look, unwrap, uh, etc. Um, building on these things, and I think moving more towards what uh, problems with Sentinel One will now, I'm sure, will begin to introduce is is that our data sets will keep increasing, and and uh, uh, if, if the mission lasts 30 years, we will not be able to do 900 by 900 matrices for every pixel to do complete time series analysis. So the sequential estimator approach was, was uh, proposed by Ansari at all at DLR. The idea is to uh, break up your long time series uh, stacks of images into mini stacks, apply covariance-based approach on the mini stacks, and then adjust the mini stacks with respect to each other. Uh, we have implemented a prototype of this. It's available on the, on the fringe repository on, 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 on GitHub. and uh, so far, it seems to work very well, but this is an active area of research, and, and more will be done in, in, in this direction. Uh, the one good thing about this approach, the sequential estimator approach, is it's computationally efficient. Definitely more computationally efficient than doing the entire correlation matrix in one go. Um, so uh, here are some examples from Heresh again uh, for applying these over a time series uh, of data in Iran, and uh, once the time series was done, uh, shown are the uh, co-seismic signal estimated from the time series and the post-seismic signal from the time series. And there are three pixels here. B is very, very close to the maximum deformation point, and if you were to plot um, time series from it, uh, the method uh, captures the signal really well. One of the I think the initial skepticisms from the from the geophysics community of these co covariance techniques are what happens if you have a large signal. Since the inversion happens in wrapped space, uh, there is, uh, uh, I believe, there's no loss of information. Uh, the co-seismic signal will be seen in every pair, 
uh, that is computed uh, between images before and after the earthquake. And as a result, the inversion, uh, you don't lose any signal. Um, uh, Harish may know better, but I believe the SPAS inversions underestimated the, the magnitude of the deformation due to the spatial averaging in this case. Uh, yeah, that was the case. Unfortunately, we don't have the plot here, but yeah. Yeah, whereas this analysis was done at, at, at full resolution, the, the maximum extent of deformation was better captured. Um, there's also other directions in which time series are going. In, this, in, in the context of this talk, we're only talking about time series in the context, in, in uh, terms of deformation time history. But you can also talk about uh, time series to detect uh, uh, anomalies and, and, and for change detection uh, for hazard mapping. So here's um, the correlation matrix for a point that was impacted by the earthquake. And as you can see, the scenes before the earthquake correlate well with each other. And the scenes after the earthquake correlate well with each other. But you clearly see this block like pattern showing up in the in the correlation matrices. So there's a lot of uh, uh, these data sets are rich. There's a lot that can still be built on top of these. Uh, I have like five minutes, so I just want to conclude the the overview talk. Like I said, we are only scratching the surface here. This is just to give you an overview of what's happening in the time series community. There still are challenges for INSAR phase and wrapping. As, as, as always a challenge, particularly for high resolution analysis, especially if you want to do high resolution analysis over wider area. Troposphere continues to be uh, our biggest error source. Uh, and maybe ionosphere will also start becoming more important for, uh, will definitely be more important for L-band sensors. But troposphere impacts all wavelengths, continues to be a, a, a problem. Uh, mission continuity will be uh, something uh, that, uh, may uh, inhibit us from studying uh, all kinds of geophysical phenomenon. Longer time series are needed to discriminate between uh, different types of phenomenon occurring over the same region. Uh, there's possibly work to be done in combining uh, time series from ascending and descending geometries and possibly overing, uh, overlapping stacks. And uh, one of the more practical challenges that that we need to address is the computational and storage needs. Uh, the sequential estimator seems to be a promising direction, but again, these imageries are going at, an, at a really fast rate. So we need to be really smart in, in, uh, in developing the ability to update stacks and update time series with new acquisitions without having to redo the analysis from scratch. Uh, another challenge for the time series community is to label our data with uncertainties associated uh, with it. This is still work in progress. It's an active field of research, but that would, again, uh, uh, significantly, I think, uh, increase the, the confidence in the time series estimates if we start annotating our products with uncertainty estimates. So uh, I will conclude here. There are some backup slides on, on what these core components are. I would encourage you to, to look at it on your own. Um, but that's essentially time series in SAR in a nutshell. Any, any questions? Um, I had a question in terms of uh, SBAS processing. Um, what sort of, uh, is there any sort of risks of like bias introduced in terms of how you uh, network out um, like what pairs you use? Uh, yes, uh, Harish, you want to take that? You want me to take that? No, please go ahead, please. Yeah, so there's been some recent studies out of DLR, and we're also trying to replicate the effects on, on our side. Uh, the, it, the number of interferograms or, uh, that a single SAR scene participates in 
I think in this paper, DLR calls it the bandwidth of your interferogram network, uh, seems to be correlated with the amount of bias you would expect, you observe in your estimated time series. So if you use only one or two scenes, uh, one or two interferograms uh, for a given scene, that is likely to have much higher bias than going up to five or 10 interferograms but then going up to five or 10 interferograms starts with an SPAS like approach, especially if you're just doing 2D phase unwrapping, start introducing its own challenges in your ability to unwrap those interferograms. So yes, there's definitely a bias associated with using only a small subset of interferograms. And that is, and the, how much it is, 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 is still an active, uh, how to quantify it is still an active uh, area of research and people are trying to understand it. Thank you. And, and basically this is, I mean, if in the absence of, of, of sort of nuisance signals, uh, you shouldn't have a bias, but in this case, um, the assumption is that there are, you know, correlated, signals in there may be related to soil moisture variation and et cetera, then that cause biases. Is that correct, Hugh? That is correct. Yeah, so we don't know all the sources of noise in our data. Uh, so the I think the, the conclusion that that they're reaching is in the absence of knowing all the source of, of uh, phase and correlation in our data, the best thing to do is use all possible pairs. Is there a question in this chat about the which method to use for volcanoes? Specifically, they are asking uh, PS or SPAS. PS. So, I would say that uh, this is a uh, you can take this with a pinch of salt. This is my personal opinion. I think uh, globally, all groups are sort of converging on the covariance-based methods. Uh, for, for the time series analysis. They're just calling it with different names, for example, Squeezer, Caesar, Fringe, um, MLE. Um, yeah. Is there any intuition of how performing the PCA in complex uh, phase with sort of? Yeah, there's plenty of papers on it. We can point you to it. If you look at the list of references on, on the fringe page, they should point you to it. It goes all the way back to uh, Guarneri and Tebaldini. You can look at the Squeezer paper. You can look at the Caesar paper and all of us, all of those essentially include uh, uh, examples of, of what this looks like. And, and these are essentially the results of uh, of of, uh, the, the, uh, of such analysis over a data set by Harish. Uh, 